Technoculture. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I am Federica Bressan, and today I am here with Robert Margulef, Grammy-winning producer and recording engineer, electronic music pioneer, film producer, and entrepreneur. Welcome to Technoculture, Robert. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Or you're happy to be here in my studio. Exactly. I welcome you on the podcast, but the podcast today is in your home studio. Can I call it home studio? Yeah, yeah it's a home studio, but it's a studio studio. It's a studio studio. Yeah. Well, in Los Angeles. Yes. Thank you very much for having me here. You're very, very welcome. You, of course, have had a remarkable career, and it would be natural to ask you about all the stories you can tell about it. But something that really struck me about you is that you are still looking forward, pushing the boundaries, and you're very interested in where we are today and where we'll be tomorrow. The past already happened, so I don't want to continually relive where I came from. It gets really boring because I've already been there. But uh, looking at the now and the future, I think, is very, very important because I think in many ways uh, we're at another stepping stone in the media world, and uh, technology does change the art. It affects how we write and how we compose music. And I think music lives on in our memories. You know, it's invisible. You can't see it and you can't touch it. But it lives on in what we think about it and what it does to us emotionally and empathetically. I mean, music is about empathy. It has no practical use. It's not like a food substance or an object or anything. It's invisible. And if you unplug it from the wall, it disappears. So I'm interested in that. I'm interested in how technology changes the art. And uh, it has been my quest to look into the future. I guess you might say I'm a futurist in audio. We're at a very interesting place right now in audio because now audio is being delivered in a new way. And that's on mobile devices primarily and streaming. There are no more record albums. Well, there's some vinyl out there, but... It's a very small part of the billions of downloads that we now have in experience music. It's changed the face of music and how we make it and how we deliver it. And now, with the advent of mobile media and headphones, we're again at a juncture of changing music radically because we deliver it differently on headphones than we do on loudspeakers. And it changes the way we write music Billie Eilish would be a very good example of this confessional kind of music that we're now facing. And the music is written on headphones and listened to on headphones, which is a different kind of experience because the music unfolds in our head. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Because one would say, well, how does that really change my listening experience? Can't I listen to the old classics in a headphone? You know, how yeah, does you that can, change? You can hear old classics in your headphones. And we can look at that as uh, objective music. This is a sonic picture of three guys standing on a stage sawing away on their instruments. Or this is a piece of music that's playing behind a motion picture film. And uh, it is what I call objective music. It is a report of reality. It is where the microphones are used to report a real-time event. But music is moving towards subjectivity. And by that I mean the music exists on our new folk instrument, the laptop, and it unfolds in our head on earphones. There is no more architecture. Music originally was defined as... Where is the music going to be listened to? And I'm going to write music based on where it's going to be played. Like chamber music. Chamber music, for example. Or a concert, a symphony hall concert, or, you know, the Los Angeles Philharmonic on at Disney. And that's a sonic picture of the Boston Symphony playing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. People are sitting in the audience, and the microphones and the recording equipment are there to record the event. It is a, um, a storage medium for a real-time event. But pop music, it has no real place. There is no more architecture for that kind of music. When you start working with a synthesizer, which is what I did in the early 70s, 
we end up with music that are only vibrating electrons and they only happen in space, basically unfold in the storage medium, in the computer, basically. There is no real time. There is only, there is no objectivity. There is only subjectivity. So the music is created in space with vibrating electrons and unfolds in our head on earphones. And now, especially with immersive audio coming on board, we're able to finally store vector, uh, what we call HRTF, hearing response transfer function, where our brain helps us decide where music is coming from, where a sound is coming from. And I submit to you that that is as powerful as pitch and duration in music. The ability to be able to create directionality in a musical composition and not be just bound to left, right, and center, but to be able to have sound come from behind you or above you uh, can impart tremendous emotional results in a listener. I mean, before we invented the microphone, great composers like Wagner or Bach took advantage of spatialization in terms of how they wrote for the church, for example, in religious music, where the pipe organ lived in the back of the church and the boys' choir was in the front of the church, and there were other sounds coming from different places, that energy created a great deal of mystery and spirituality. And we ditched it all when we invented recording because we couldn't store HRTF electrically. Now with the new technology, we can store that music and that, those sounds and the directionality of where the sounds are coming from. So now when a young composer sits down at his kitchen table with his iPad and he's writing in uh, Ableton or in Cubase, he can now control that aspect of his music writing as well because the music's being delivered on headphones. And when you deliver music on headphones, it unfolds inside your head. You say this will change how we compose and how we deliver music. So you say technology drives the arts, but sometimes technology is received passively and it's designed to be used in a specific way, maybe especially today. You receive building blocks, ready-made things, more than probably in the 60s and the 70s. Was it easier to be more creative then? Is there a danger to be well, passive there's users? A, there's the interesting thing is you don't know what you're doing when you're doing it. You only figure out what you've done after you've done it, <laughs> okay, yeah. so to speak, right? For example, when we were working with Stevie Wonder back in the day in 1972 in Studio B at the record plant, that room we built with quad monitors because at that time the industry thought that quad was going to be a big thing. And uh, we designed a console for that room from API uh, that had quad monitor bus. So we had two speakers in the front and two speakers in behind us. Unfortunately, the technology of being able to try to put quad, just as four channels, on vinyl was a miserable failure. It did not work as much as we wanted it to work. But what the quad monitoring did okay, was I was able to take Stevie out of the recording studio on the other side of the glass and put him in the control room, which became a control room studio, right? Because he performed in the control room, unless it was an acoustic instrument like a piano or a set of drums. But if it was electronic, Rhodes, Fender Rhodes piano, or synthesizers, keyboards and stuff, or I would put like the guitar amps in the studio, but the player would be in the control room. I was able to use the quad monitoring in the control room to affect the way Stevie played because I could put a guitar part over here opposing his clavinet part over here, and the drums could be in front and the background vocals could be behind him. And what we had was immersive music. And it did affect, if you listen to those records, Music of My Mind, Talking Book, Inner Visions, or Fulfilling This, those records were composed and performed in that way in that studio in quad. We monitored in quad. We had to finally mix it down to stereo. But you'll note that those records sound very dry because we invented reverb and echo and all these effects to emulate the sense of space and distance. But once I had quad... 
I didn't need to emulate the sense of space and distance because I could create this very close, very confessional, Billie Eilish now like thing where Stevie was this close to the microphone, right? He, he would be able to touch it with his hands so he knew where it was because he's unsighted, right? But we made those records with that very close, intimate feeling. And that's the reason that these records, have many reasons, I mean, the songs are fantastic and have tremendous social ramifications, but they also have a very tight point of view. It's as tight as Bing Crosby in 1946, the Paramount Theater with riots in the streets because of the way he was using his microphone, where it was very close and he could make his voice as loud as the whole band. Everyone was going crazy. They wanted to be close to Bing, right? That's what we did with Stevie. That's what Post Malone and Billie Eilish are doing now. Very close to the mic, very intimate, very confessional, personal music. So the medium is affecting the message. Yeah, the invention of the microphone um, changed everything. Changed everything. Yeah. yeah. Allowed for certain yeah. things. And then to the ability to store it without too many interlocutors. And by that I mean, you know, in the days of making LPs, for example, extended play vinyl records, you had to have an infrastructure to manufacture them, to print the covers, to distribute them, to take into account breakage when we were doing uh, lacquers, you know, 78s, right? So the record companies would take the big lion's share of the money back. They would advance all the money for the studio time. And you had to have a lot of technicians running around, you know, with the pencil protectors and the pens and the guys with short sleeve wide shirts, uh, white shirts in the control room. And it was a very different and very separate culture than to the artist culture. But as soon as that started to break down and the technology became simpler and simpler, we needed fewer technologists. So all these things have their space. I mean, we have Dolby Atmos in the movie theater, and it's, that's what it's for. Yeah, they can still coexist. It, they co yeah, they're all yeah. coexistive. But now, who are the new cowboys and Indians? Who is the 17-year-old? Who is Billie Eilish and Post Malone playing music for? It's certainly not people my age, okay? It's for their peers. They're people who are facing life right now. So technology does drive the art. We write music within the parameters that, that we're given for the performance. So when I think of coming out here in the studio and making making music with my own partner, Aaron, I, uh, I think that the music is here to be delivered on headphones, on a personal way, for my cowboy, for the young cowboys and Indians. Who are they? They're the kids that are working at SpaceX and at uh, Blue Origin and... Uh, doing science and uh, figuring out how to get the satellite in the right position to hit the space station and designing and building stuff for fuel and doing medical research and stuff. And they're sitting at their desks and they're listening to music on headphones and on earbuds. And their music is different than my music. And their music has fewer people in between the creation and the listener. When I can come into a room like this, I don't have to pay 1500 to $2,500 a day for a recording studio. What does it mean? It means that the music is more available and uh, touchable by the creatives themselves because they know how to manipulate the technology. That's why I say the laptop is a new musical instrument because Folk it all instrument. lives inside the computer. Yeah. While we're sitting in a studio, let me ask you how studios have changed. The type of gear has changed. There has been the digital revolution or transition. Of course, analog is still there. Now they live together. Yes, and I so, like that. This studio is a hybrid. First of all, there's no glass in here. There's no acoustic room, right? This is both an acoustic room and a mixing facility. We have the microphone standing here in the room. We all put on headphones, turn off the monitors, and suddenly we're in the studio, right? It's the same thing. The space is dead. The acoustics are controlled. You can look up at the ceiling and see the diffusers. You can see that the room is treated acoustically because we want to emulate what we're doing, what we used to do in the studio in acoustic space. We want to be able to emulate it and listen to it on loudspeakers. That's the transition from acoustic to electric, right? 
But now we can do most of it in the same room. I mean, it's a luxury to have an acoustic space and a big Steinway piano, but if I need an acoustic space and a big piano and a set of acoustic drums and there are six players, I'll go to the Village Recorder or to East West or to Capitol where they have the big studios and I'll use them for the time I need them. But then I'd rather be able to roll out of bed at two in the morning and mix it when I say, oh, hey, Zeus, it's Aaron's nickname. Hey, Zeus, I don't know about the sound of the kick drum. He says, okay, let's jump in here and we jump in the room here and we make changes as we go. We're not paying a daily rate. We're not in a taxi cab. We need big studios. They are functional and correct to have when they're needed. But a young artist who is, you know, driving for Uber during the day and coming in trying to make his dreams come true doesn't have $1,500 a day. And there are no gatekeepers to stop him from working anymore. You can't say, shine with me, kid. I'll make you as famous as the Beatles, and I'm going to advance you $200,000, right? And then you work for the rest of your life paying back the $200,000 on the art that you made. You might not make as much, but you don't have to sell as many recordings or downloads as you used to to make the same money. So things are a-changing in the business world. The record companies are really sort of having to realign themselves in terms of, because they no longer manufacture, stamp, uh, distribute, ship, drop ship, all that kind of stuff, uh, records around, people going to record stores to buy records. Everybody just buys what they want on demand from uh, Spotify or uh, Apple Music or any one of a dozen aggregators that are out there. It's all streaming. It's billions and billions of times we listen to the songs. Are the artists getting paid correctly? No. The upper 10% probably are making enough money, but really artists now are making money from the real-time uh, appearances, public appearances. The recordings are simply uh, the, the window dressing in the front of the store to get people to come in and to participate. Are you worried about all the noise that is out there because many more people no, could upload? No, Not at all? Like, why? Because it will fade in time and the pearls the, will the, the, come the, to the surface? The, the cream rises to yeah, the surface. Yeah. The good music survives. Some of it won't survive. Some of the good music won't survive. But most of it that really is lasting and means something to the culture lives on. And I speak primarily of my work with Stevie Wonder. Living just enough for the city had social ramifications. Devo, uh, Whip It, for example, or any one of the Devo songs are about the environment. And it was 25 or 30 years ago I did that record. Too early. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it's never too early. But uh, there is a kind of an awareness mm -hmm. in that kind of music. I think the most successful music that I've ever done in my career have all had social overtones. They're there for, for a message. It's not just a bunch of fluff of how I love you, baby, and how I want to touch your whatever. Which right? is fine. Are you also okay with just... Having a good time, yeah. Like, yeah, of course, not all art should be politically or socially engaged. Um, for me, but you, oh, for oh, me, yeah? I, that's where I like to live. Oh, you're actually, okay. I, I, I do the other music. It's fine. It's, a, you know, a little toe tapper here, and uh, it's wonderful over there, and... Uh, in some cases, uh, in rock and roll, it's good to see somebody totally literate, obliterate themselves on stage and self-destruct and tip over the drum kit and break their guitar and take drugs and fall apart. And it's a spectacle. And people, it's like watching a car accident. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, everyone kind of slows down and goes, whoa, I feel sorry for him. I'm glad it's not me. And the guy's like, you know, Kurt Cobain killing himself in the end. And people taking their own lives because of their desperation and fear. Uh, people like to watch that. It's like warfare, in a sense. But I think that music exists also to change the world. And I think that that's the responsibility of artists in a social context. And the music now is being delivered in a social context, Facebook, Spotify. But... You know, we can always try to figure out why the wheels are turning. I mean, that's part of what academia is. Why was Bach creative? Or what drove Mozart? Or Jerry Garcia? What made him write music like that, right? It's still something that 
an artist takes from his environment, from his place, and reflects his feelings about it. And I think in most cases, there's a kind of morality about that that attracts me. Talking about how you used to work in the studio in the 70s, first of all, you said that there was a lot of freedom, kind of time and relax to experiment, which is not always what you think of a recording studio, which needs to be booked and it's expensive, so you're prepared when you walk in, do your thing and get out. I was curious That's to know... That's the reason for this room. Yeah. The, the booking here is endless. I can work as many... As Zeus and I can work as many hours as we want or not, okay? There is no longer a... Uh, the technology is not so expensive that we have to make sure that we can pay for it. It's as if creativity required a non-optimized workflow. You need that time to play around a little bit and explore. Yes. And this is what happened yeah, then. Yeah, music is written in... The, used to say, oh... You're not going to come in here and write in the studio, or your studio bill is going to be five hundred thousand dollars. You know, you don't. I don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay, when I need to use the high price spread for an afternoon or ten hours to cut some basic tracks with four or five players, that's the time to spend the fifteen hundred dollars or twenty five hundred dollars a day. But for overdubbing and for mixing, I want to be able to take the time to explore a variety of approaches to the music. You know, the interesting thing is I'm working with a technology called Tsunami. It's from HERE 360. Uh, and they've developed a program to spatialize stereo, existing stereo music. I mean, I can mix from channels, too. I mean, I could mix, you know, 48 channels of separated stems. But the interesting thing about going and delving into the past, I've just been listening to some stuff I've been doing with Stevie Wonder. I did a spatialized version of uh, Boogie on Reggae Woman. And the thing that I like about the spatialization process is that it encompasses and contains what we originally intended to do. So if it's a Miles Davis record, I want to have what the engineer was thinking about. I don't want to remix Miles Davis into some other format that wasn't that the producer and the engineers are not present because the function of translating the sonic energy into electricity a guy called a recording engineer, right, has a certain level of art and creativity as well. And I want to make sure that those things are preserved as well as the music because the recording is the performance. There is something else I heard you say about how it used to be to work in the studio in those years and that it was like an archive. You used the word archive. Right. How so? Well, we would... Uh, you talk about expense, for example... When we worked with Stevie, there was no budget. We just worked until we were finished, which is very, um, was very indulgent, I guess you might say. We would come in at 4 in the afternoon and leave at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. with the sun coming up, okay? We used to call it Stevie time. Being unsighted, he really wasn't uh, and still isn't very uh, cognizant of time day and night, you know, light and dark, never was really a part of it. He would work when he was feeling really creative. Which Sometimes, is the night, normally. Yeah. Well, <laughs> people like to perform in the dark for some reason. I don't know why that is, but it's a different vibe, I guess, when you play at night in an intimate space. And what did you mean by archive? Well, we would record a bunch of songs and not finish them and we would put them in our library, in our archive. And then when the time came to do an album, we'd say, oh, let's pull this one as a good one. We'll take that one. We'll finish that. Oh, there's another one we did six weeks ago or ten weeks ago or last year that's going to fit. We'll take that and finish that, and we could put background vocals on it or another rhythm track, or we'd evolve it. But we would constantly work in terms of a library or archive. We were never saying, oh, we're going to have to write six songs for this album or 10 songs for this album, and then we'd get down and try to figure out a name for the album, and then we would, you know, write the songs based around the theme, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But basically, we were able to write, I think there must be, Malcolm Cecil and I must have written, a, worked on 150 songs with Stevie over five years. Maybe 50 of them made it to the daylight, right? Some of them will never be heard. They'll die when Stevie passes away. 
Those songs will die with him in his pocket of his suit. Wait, because they're in not, his head, or he he, he has never an got archive. around to them. Yeah, he never got around to them, or they're not up to snuff. I think that there's certain music, and I think Stevie's music falls into that category, that space, that these are recordings that change the face of pop music. And I uh, don't take that responsibility lightly. These are recordings that must be preserved for the sake and posterity. Every much as Bach left volumes of, or any of the great composers left volumes of music behind them that was written down on paper so it didn't perish. All right. Our music, a lot of that music was never written down on paper and never will be written down on paper. Right? It exists in the medium. Mm hmm. So for me, uh, I did talk to some people at Iron Mountain a few weeks ago. Producers and engineers wing of the Academy were at a party, and we were talking about Stevie's stuff, a lot of tapes. But not only do they need to be digitized properly, okay, correctly, but we need to get a music historian to work with Stevie while he's still here for him to talk about the various songs and what he did with them. And the material itself should be preserved properly. And I think it's something that the Library of Congress or the Smithsonian, somebody like that. And I have recently discussed that with Steve. But I think, you know, we all feel like we're immortal and we're never going to leave the planet. Leaving the planet is for somebody else. I'm here forever, you know. It's not the truth. It's the only thing we do once is die. We do it once when we're born and we do it once when we die. In between is called life. And uh, somehow, when you're young, especially when you're young, you think you're immortal and death doesn't mean that much to you, you know. But uh, when you do something that really changes the world, it's and again, it's not only for Stevie, but it's for Malcolm Cecil and myself as well to make sure that our our history is preserved because people learn from the past so you can't have a great future if you don't know where you're coming from. And I think that that's why people study history. I don't really want to live in history that much, but I know I made some. Okay, so I think that for the sake of bringing enlightenment to the next generation or generations, we have to respect our past and understand it. Otherwise, we'd be like a bunch of chimpanzees constantly having to relearn the basics of existence. The difference between us and chimpanzees is that we have a memory of where we can go and we can be civilized enough to low, to teach somebody something and not have to repeat the same knowledge over and over again because it's already been dealt with. You know, we tend to use the inventions of our time as building blocks for the future. And I think a lot of what I did with music and with Malcolm and Stevie is that we built a lot of these building blocks. Were we conscious that we were doing it? No. We lived totally in the now. And uh, I always used to say, and I still say it, you know, sometimes it's better to live in the now and not think too much about the future because the future fucks up your now, basically, Okay. It's important to live a day at a time, but to remain creative and empathetic. I think that that is the two things that I think are most important, what I've learned. It keeps you grounded also. Yeah, yeah. But when grounded. did you start realizing that you were making history? Uh, when people started telling me I was. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really don't know. I, I, still, I still don't feel I've done much, really. I'm more interested in what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. I'm uh, more interested in chasing some other new new dream, new songwriter, new music, new sounds, new experiences. And that's really what we have to be doing now. That's the purpose of art, is to change the world. Thank you so much. You're very welcome.